Hey, everyone. Before we get to today's episode of Perpetual Chess, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who has supported the show. Ways to support Perpetual Chess include telling a friend about the show, subscribing on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use, better yet, leaving a positive review on that platform. But most of all, I want to thank the people who've supported me with the new Patreon page. If you haven't heard, it's patreon.com slash perpetual chess. And the suggested donation there is $2 a month. So I tried to keep it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. The donations go to cover things like the production, the audio equipment, and the hosting for the show. So if you can't afford it, you definitely shouldn't donate. But if you can, it's really appreciated and it helps out a lot. And guess what? I think it's also going to make the show better. What we're going to do is people who donate to the show will get advance notice of the guests and they will have the chance to send in questions to the guests. So if you feel like there's some topic I don't cover enough, or if you have some favorite player that you're waiting for them to come on, well, there's a good chance we're going to get them at some point. So now you can sit back and wait. And then when someone's coming on who interests you, you can pounce like a cheetah and get your questions in. I think this is going to make it a better show overall, more community driven. I've always said I want this show to be by the people and for the people. Well, I think that this will help make that happen. So thanks again for all the support and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Perpetual Chess. We've got another great guest today who I will get to in a second. But first, I just wanted to quickly mention that there will not be an episode next week. Uh, Here in the United States, we have a holiday coming up, Thanksgiving, and I will be traveling. I will be in the car for four days with two children under five years old. So say a little prayer for me. I would rather be podcasting and I'll be back at it next week. But that's just a heads up. But The good news is for this week, we've got a great guest, supporter of the podcast, outstanding chess player, uh, woman's grandmaster, Tatyav Abrahamian. Tatyav, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. So Tatyav, I know that you've listened to at least a few shows. um, So you you may be keen to the fact that when someone's recently played in a tournament, we like to start out by talking about it. And unlike some recent guests, your your last tournament looks like it was a pretty good showing to me. So uh, how was um, your tournament in Los Angeles? Well, it was a very small tournament, only five rounds over two days. Um, I played way too many children that <laughs> I wanted to play. Uh, it, it was a pretty good tournament. Um, I wasn't, I can't say I was happy about the quality of my games, but I'm rarely happy about the quality of my games. But it's always nice to score some points. And I had a, I had a long break. I didn't play during the summer. And then I had a tournament in September, and my next one is going to be over Thanksgiving, so I just wanted to get a small tournament in. Oh, okay, so what's coming up over Thanksgiving? Well, there's a tournament in uh, Orange County. Well, it's in SoCal. It used to be in LA, now it's in Orange County. It's going to be the American Open. Oh, fun. Yeah, that's a big one, right? Yeah, it hasn't been for the past few years, but this year there are a lot of players coming from the universities from Texas, so there'll be seven grandmasters. I'm hoping I'll get to play at least. Like three or four of them. Okay. And um, I know that mm-hmm. you're, you, like a lot of us, are someone who plays and also does some coaching. So how, like, how on top of your game are you able to stay during the course of the year? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, I, I feel like I haven't been playing as much lately, especially this year, because I spent so much time in St. Louis working there. But, I mean, when I'm playing, I feel like I just give my all when, you know, I'm trying very hard at the board and you know, trying my best in every game. But, yeah, the problem is between the tournaments. So that part is, I feel, it's a little bit challenging, especially when you have a lot of lessons or, like, I also teach after school. So sometimes, you know, things really pile up or when one of our coaches is not here, so I have to start covering for them. So, I mean, I'm not, um, I think my time management is quite poor, so I'm not on top of my game as much as I should be. Time management in chess or in life or in both? I mean, both. Yeah, I think they might, I wonder if they go together. Like, I wonder if people who, 
you know, like time time trouble addicts are also like often late for stuff. Probably. Uh, because you know it's like you you have to feel this urgency to do something like in chess you have to have this pressure to move on in life like you have to have a deadline to actually get things done mm-hmm. at least that's true for me I don't maybe it's different for other people maybe they different things motivate them yeah me too I'm a procrastinator by nature um so like definitely like back when I was in college like writing papers and stuff like that I would put off to the last minute but I found that as a chess teacher, it's just not a good job for, for procrastinating. Like you, you just can't be late, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's actually broken me in my habits a little bit because if you're the only, if the kids are all counting on you to be there, it's like the one thing you can't really mess around with. Yeah. But the problem is when you're at school and you know, you have a paper to write, you can just pull an all right, all nighter, write your paper, turn it in, and then you're done or you study and then you get a test and the test is on what you studied and unfortunately you cannot do that in chess right well do you, you try to like it. cram your opening lines when you have a tournament coming up um sometimes huh. I mean, <laughs> yeah i have a tournament coming up and i have to start looking over my lines and do you so, i mean you played me, sorry go ahead i said you're making me feel bad about my <laughs> 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 sorry that was not my goal i mean i think uh everyone knows how, that like you know, unless you're top 20 in the world or whatever, you have to pay the bills. So it's no small feat to uh, strike a balance between like actually making a living, whether it's in chess or outside of chess and then competing, you know, and the, the stronger you are, the, the harder it is like the, you know, the, the less room for error you have. So, um, I think people, uh, will understand and feel like you're doing just fine. Yeah, I mean, it's also hard because, you know, like, you have a weakness in chess. Let's say your end games are bad, and then you dedicate, like, months studying end games, and then you go to the next tournament, and you don't get a single end game. Right, exactly. It kind of feels like you wasted all your time, you know? Yeah. And do you feel like you have, is that speaking from personal experience, or do you feel like you have a different weakness, or? Um, or no weaknesses? <laughs> all the weaknesses. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean that that has happened to me before that I like I was trying to work on my like a certain opening in a positional chess and then that happened to me and I felt like I made the wrong decision and I was like really upset after the game felt like a waste but I don't think it's I, I want to say it's never a waste really because you know you're improving and um, it's like just because you learn something or you know, you're doing it well while you're practicing doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it during the tournament. Like sometimes before a tournament, like I'll solve puzzles and I feel like I'm so sharp, and then during the games, I keep blundering. It's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It just feels like those two things are disconnected, even though I know they're not. Yeah, I think it makes a difference in the long run, but in the short run, it's uh, it's kind of tough to to see the connection. Mm-hmm. Um. So you work for the American Chess Academy, is that mm-hmm. is, okay? So, um, and so you you said you do after school programs. You also do some private lessons. Uh, and you, we've seen your work in St. Louis, so I, I'm, it seems like you keep pretty busy. Yeah, so we have a, <clears throat> I work with the American Chess Academy. We have locations um, in Southern California, in the Valley, in Glendale, and Burbank, Pasadena. Uh, so we actually have a physical location, so I teach there. I do some after schools. So I do private lessons. Um, it's, it's, it's a reason. I, I don't think I work, like, 24 7 i'm constantly teaching so um so the job in st louis actually helps me a lot because you know it just like this year i took the whole summer off and i was there and you know, i could make like a decent amount of money that lasts me throughout the year so it's kind of a nice to have a balance and have different incomes i think so you're not fully committed to one thing so if something goes wrong you know you don't you don't have a backup yeah, yeah, I uh, I feel that way too. Like that part of the reason my motivation for starting this podcast was like just to have a different outlet. I mean, I I love teaching and it's fun, but like, yeah, you definitely sort of if there's never a break, you you it's hard to to maintain your motivation to be good at it. Yeah, it's very easy to get burned out from teaching, and it has happened to me before because you know it's self employment, but then it becomes a routine. And that's one of the fun parts of, you know, playing chess and teaching is you have a flexible schedule and you get to travel and this and that. But when you don't have tournaments coming up and you're just at home and, you know, like every day becomes the same, then I think it becomes a little overwhelming. Yeah, for sure. And you, so this academy, um, you work with uh, your former coach, 
Uh, mm-hmm. Ar- Armin Arbat. Sorry, can you can you Arbatsmian. say it? Again? Sorry, can you say it again? <laughs> it's Armin Arbatsmian. Okay, I apologize, <laughs> Armin. Um, so uh, it looks sounds like it's a pretty successful program. If uh, there are that many locations. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, San- California is and uh, LA even is so spread out, so it's very, you know, very easy to have different locations. But um, yeah, we have in Glendale only we have 150 kids. Okay. Of all different levels, which I think for a chess school is really big. So how is it structured? They come to classes at night, or you guys do tournaments, or all of the above, or what? Yeah, all of the above. We do four tournaments a year. One of the tournaments is actually with Casper of Chess Foundation, so they sponsor the tournament. There's actually um, prizes. That's and, great. Yeah, and uh, we have weekly classes. We have twice a week, we have more advanced group, twice a week, more Beginners, the tournament player, but still beginner, and we have also complete beginner group, so you know for all levels. So they, we actually have a location rented, and we have the chess set set up and everything. So they just come, they you know they play, and then at the end we do a lecture and we give them homework, and that's our structure. Okay, and you guys, do you guys? You mentioned loca- uh, renting a place for tournaments, but do you have like a physical location uh, for the academy generally? Yeah, that's what I mean. We have a location for an academy. Okay, that's what I. Yeah, I, that's what I thought the first time, but then I wasn't sure the second time you mentioned it. So I just wanted to be clear because you know it's a lot of this is just my own personal interest because I know I know some chess teachers that are pretty successful uh, with like brick and mortar academies, but it always seems like higher risk, higher reward sort of business model than just you know working from your house or going to people's houses and schools and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like I said, it's good to do like different things. I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I know a lot of people aren't able to, but if you're able to, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, and and I, I imagine you have a good relationship since the since uh, Armin was your coach for so many years, and now you guys work together. Oh yeah, I have, yeah, Armin. I think is like one of the best people ever. Nice. He's been so nice to me since I moved here, and you know, he's he's so understanding when I take time off. I, I'll tell him now I'm going to St. Louis. It's you know he's. Like, he never tells me oh, you can't go or anything. Like, he's uh, also a world youth coach. So, like, those are the times that I have to be in town or if he has something to do, I have to be in town. Right. But I, I just take so much time off. You know, it's like I'm such a terrible employee. Because, ah. uh, you know, I play U.S. Championship. I play internationally. I'm in St. Louis all the time. No, <laughs> I mean, but time. come on, Tatia. If it's good for the brand to have, like, a chess star like yourself uh, <laughs> working for the company. But, no, but I mean, it's like it's so nice because I know someone's going to be covering for me, and you know, it's just so understanding of what I do. And, yeah, and no, it is good. And I it's, have a relationship like that. Yeah, and it's not always a given that, like, within an organization, especially like sort of like small chess teaching sort of organization, that there's going to even be the coverage. You know, that that you would have someone to do it. Um, okay, so since since we've already mentioned uh, Armenia a little bit, uh, we might as well get into your background. So you came to the U.S. when you were. 13 um i i'm a sucker for the like come to the u.s stories and i find of course being that i host this podcast i find the the chess stories like the the interconnection of chess particularly interesting so you were like a young talent and came here um what was like how was that experience like both on both sides of it like leaving armenia and coming to a totally different place no it's pretty terrible (laughs) (laughs) i believe it yeah um i mean I don't think, well, my experience is different because a lot of chess players come here as students, so I feel like that's more of a conscious choice to do that and, you know, make a choice to stay in the United States, and I was very young, so it was my family's choice to do that. Um, actually, my family applied to come to the U.S. in 1991, and they had a they had a visa, but things didn't work out, so they weren't able to come. And then in 2001, at some point, they got a letter saying, you know, you have three more months until your visa expires. And then, and you know, that your visa expires and you can't come here anymore. So at that time, our situation, financial situation in Armenia was really bad because you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, my mom lost her job. My dad was making like $20 per month. Wow. Yeah. And... You know, they're like electricity outages, so we'll have electricity a few hours a day. We wouldn't have, like, never had, like, hunting, running hot water. And, like, we lived in the center of the city, so we still had, like, water. And, uh, you know, like, life was still better than not be- living 
in the center of the city, but financially my family was really struggling. So my parents decided, you know, they're going to sell the apartment. They sold the apartment at the cost of the tickets to come to the U.S. And actually my dad couldn't come for the first few months. I don't remember why not. There was some issue, I think, with his paperwork or something like that. So I came with my mom and my sister, and then my dad joined us. And I mean, I mean, it was a very difficult transition for me because it just came out of nowhere. My, you know, my parents told me we're moving to the U.S. Like I didn't want to leave. I had my life there. I had my chess, and um, I think that's a very difficult age because you know you're a teenager. You you already have a sense of yourself, but not really. And, you know, you have a life already, um, you have your friends and everything. Uh, so it was very difficult for me when we moved here. Yeah, under- understandably. So there's there's a lot that I want to uh, follow up on from that. But so first mm-hmm. of all, I, I'm I, reading up a little bit. It looked like, so were your parents like academics or what was their background? Yeah, both my parents were chemists in Armenia. Um, so my dad was working at a university. I believe he was doing in the research department, uh, but my mom stopped working, like, I, I, I don't remember her, actually, yeah, I can't even remember her working, because I feel like she lost her job pretty soon after. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that, because, you know, people listening might not real. I mean, hopefully realize, but, like, it's not like your parents weren't qualified to have work, like, they're, you know, obviously, if they're chemists, they're very smart people, worked very hard in their field, so... To, to be struggling that much to get by, I mean, and to have kids, I mean, it's got to be, you know, um, a scary situation. So, um, you know, obviously it's hard on the kid, but probably a good thing that you guys uh, made the move for the long term. Yeah, I mean, I, like at the time, of course, like I knew my family was struggling, but, you know, it's like you still don't have a full grasp on it or, and change is scary especially change like that. Yeah, so, I mean, right now I realized that was the best thing to do, but at the time I was very resentful that I had to do it. Yeah, of course. And yeah, my parents, my parents, they're both very well educated. My dad was also a jeweler besides being a chemist, and I think that was his passion because um, that was, or maybe that's how he could make money, but that's why he was spending a lot of time on it. But, um, you know, they're both talented and smart people, so, of course, they're qualified to have a job, but when you have a revolution like that, all kinds of things can happen in your country. Yeah, for for sure. And so, speaking of your country, obviously, it's got rich chess history. Um, and I read that you were a product of the Armenian Chess House. So, could you tell us a little bit about, I mean, I know that you were like a young talent and representing both Armenia and then later the U.S., but what was the chess education like there? Um. Yeah, it's a very different culture um, because when parents, I feel like in Armenia, when parents take their kids to chess, it's the goal is for their kids to become a chess player. It's not just, uh, you know, I want my kid to have something to do. I want my kid to do well at school. I mean, maybe it's different now because they do have chess in schools now. So like everyone is learning how to play chess. So I feel like now they're using chess as a different tool. But I think if you're taking your kid to chess school, you want... um, we want them to become a chess player. So my chess lessons consisted of three times a week of two, three hours each lesson, which is, I think, is completely unheard of in yeah. the U.S. for like <laughs> sure. a chess school. But in Armenia, that's normal. Like that's, I think that's that's just what you do. Wow, that's a that's a that's amazing. I mean, that explains why you're so strong. For one thing, I mean, obviously, along with like the work that you put in and probably some talent. But so what would be the nature of those lessons? Like, what would you do for those, like, nine hours a week? Oh, my God. I, I, I never put it that way. There's nine hours a week of lessons. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I just thought, like, two times a week for two, three hours. Um, uh, okay, let me try to remember. I think we would start the lessons with playing someone. And then my coach... My, my coach in Armenia was absolutely amazing. He's like the nicest person ever. My parent, his rate was $20 per month and my parents couldn't afford it. So he taught me for free for five years. Wow. Um, yeah. And he was a big believer in the Dvaryatsky book. So that is what we're working on. 
And at the time, of course, there's no computers, no access or anything. So he would make copies of the, um, what is that book that has all the novelties in it? Uh, mm. The Informant? Oh, right, yeah. So that was a big thing, right? Because that's the only way you have access to games. And yeah. he, would, he didn't even have books. He would just have the he would just copy the books. So that's another thing we would do. And also, um, before playing in a tournament, because we had the Armenian Youth Championship, so that's the tournament you have to win to qualify for World Youth. So we would copy the games of our opponents in the notebook. So we had so we knew uh, what our opponents play because you know it was a few high-rated kids that at the end you're going to have to play. So you basically instead of like looking them up on chessbase, you're like copying their games right. in your notebook and copying the games from the informant your openings in the notebook. So I, I think I still have those my notebooks with the homework he would give me and like even the homework it wasn't a copy of paper. He would like tell us the position and you write down the position and then you have to write a solution. So I still have those notebooks with all the games and all the puzzles that I was given as a kid. That's funny. And you were so you started when you were eight, and you were kind of identified as a talent right away. Is that like how does that happen? Like, do you just have a coach who says you're good, or is there like, like how, how, how did it people? I guess I mean I guess you probably have a rating system just like we do, as I think about it. No, actually, our, our system there is very different. So you don't uh, you play in. Um, uh, oh my god, the words are escaping me. You play in this category tournaments. Like qualifiers, um, okay. I, I think it's like a so I think it's a Soviet system. So you get like when you're a beginner, you play in fourth category, third, second, and first, and then you have to score um, I believe seven points out of nine. And once you become first category, you get your first rating of two thousand. So before I moved to the US, I've never heard of a rating below two thousand because you cannot go below two thousand. So that's so when a I came feeding. here and I said this rating. No, 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 it's like an Armenian rating. Oh, okay, it's not even a FIDE rating. Okay. No, because they're not FIDE rating tournament. Gotcha. So you're, again, like, I don't know how, I, I feel like it's still is the same system, but when I first came to the US and I see this rating, like, 1600, 1500, I was, I was like, shocked. I was like, 1600, they probably don't know how to play chess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> What's a 1600 rating? Like, how can you be about 2000? Um... But uh, I think in Armenia, when you go to a chess school, you have to know how to play chess. I don't think they, like any of the coaches will be sitting here and kind of, you know, teaching you, babysitting you. And, like if you make a miss, like it's unacceptable if you go on, like you're messing up the pieces and you don't know how they move. I don't think anyone would accept you. Okay. So you, you learn somewhere else and then you go there to get better. Yeah, I learned from my dad. It was very um, accidental, I think, how I learned how to play chess. How do you mean? Um, well, I was with my my dad took me to his work and he was cleaning his office and, uh, and then he had a chess set. So I asked him like, "What is this?" And then he told me, "Oh, it's a game." So I, I asked him to teach me, and then he said, "Oh, I'll just play with my friends, and then you can watch me and then you can learn." So that's how I learned how to play. Oh, so it's like the uh, the legend of I can't remember which grandmaster that like was it Capablanca who supposedly learned just by watching his dad. Well. I, I, I don't think it's just like out of nowhere. Like I think he's like taught me how the pieces move, okay. and then like I learned more about the game by just watching his friends. Like he thought that's a good way to learn. Okay. Uh, that's okay. How I started playing. And Tatiev, I follow you on Twitter, and um, you know I I enjoy your your tweets across the spectrum, but but <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that for now. But one thing I've noticed is you've got great pride in in Armenia. Um, I, you know, when there's tweets about the the Armenian genocide, you know, obviously extremely tragic event in uh, in global history. You you often highlight that, and when when Armenian chess players are uh, doing well in tournaments, obviously most prominently Leveronian, but uh, others as well. You're you're always cheering them on. So, um, what do you think? Uh, why do you think you have such a strong sense of place with your your home country? Um, I think that's how I was raised. I think. I think that's how everyone in Armenia is. Like everyone has a big pride about their country, which has its good things and bad things, of course, as as all things do. Right. You know, it's, like it's good to be proud of your culture and your heritage, but you don't want to be so blinded. You don't see the bad sides. And I think that was one of the challenges when I moved here because, like, I had this strong identity of an Armenian. 
And then I moved to the U.S. and then, you know, it's like a new culture. Everything is different. And it's kind of like, where do I fit in? Like, where do my beliefs fit in? And that was a really long journey and like an internal struggle for me. Yeah. I mean, moving, like you said, moving at the age of 13 is hard. Uh, you know, as a as a teacher, I've noticed that I like, you know, when I teach young students, like, say, below age 10, girls are just nicer than boys. You know, they're, they're just they're just more respectful and more supportive of each other. But then sometime around the early teens, it kind of flips for a while. Um, girls can be mean to each other at that age. And, you know, Southern, I mean, California, sort of the the California high schools from all the TV shows sort of have this reputation of being like very cliquish. So I don't know how, how your English was when you came in, but it, I mean, it must have just been immense culture shock, like to start to to be changing everything like that at that age. Yeah. Um, well, when we first moved in, um, we were living with, um, at first, well, like we didn't have any money. So we were living with my dad's best friend's family who's been here for like forever, like 20, 30 years, something like that. And then we moved in with another family who were friends with my parents. They were actually, when my parents were applying to come to the U.S., it was them and I think two other families, they got to know each other they knew each other, and the other families moved, but my parents didn't. So we're staying with them, and we're staying in Burbank, which is, I think, more American. It's like less immigrant. So I was going to the school, and like I didn't speak English, and it was just terrible. I think 9/11 was one of my first days of school, and wow. everyone was watching TV, and like I had no idea what was going on. I was amazed that there's a television in an American school. Right. Like that was the part that like really amazed me. Uh, but then we moved to Glendale, and Glendale is very immigrant populated, especially Armenian. So I got, started going to school that had an ESL program, so it was easier, so I could make friends and actually talk to people, and my English started to improve. When I moved here, I didn't speak English. Wow, I can't imagine what that must have been like. Um, well, I mean, obviously, you, you've you've done fine for yourself. Uh, since then, did your parents, were they able to find jobs, um, like, eventually? Yeah, um, well, at first we were on welfare, and my mom went back to school, actually. She got, she became a nurse, which I think is amazing, because yeah. she also didn't speak English. But, um, you know, she managed, and now she has a good job. Uh, my dad was also doing some jewelry jobs, uh, because one of his best friend was a jeweler, so he was... Um, you found some kind of a job. Nice. And you mentioned you have a sister. Is she uh, older or younger? Just older. Okay. Does she play chess at all? Uh, she knows how to, but um, I think my parents actually taught her how to play chess first, but she didn't really get into it. Okay. So. Okay. And so, like, what was your rating um, when you came here? Like, in so age 13, 2001, like, how, how good were you compared to the other kids of your age um i think i was 23 something oh wow okay i think i was overrated <laughs> that's that's rare yeah. that's uh, you might be the first person on perpetual chest to, to admit to being overrated at any point um not that everyone comes in and says they were underrated but you just don't hear that that admission very often yeah because uh, you know when you first when you um, I don't know how the system was or is now, but like uh, when you first play, the way your rating increases is more drastic, right? Right. Before you play five games. Oh, so you're US, and, you're saying you're USCF, like yeah, yeah, yeah not like it. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Okay, so small sample, yeah. Um. Uh, okay, but still, I, I like I think I maintained that rating somehow, but uh, I don't know if it represented my strength. I, I was number one for my age on the years I wasn't in the same category as Hikaru. Okay. <laughs> so in most years, I was number one in my age. Um. Okay, and that's boys and girls alike, right? Mm-hmm. That so so I imagine pretty quickly you started getting invited to like you know, uh, junior open and stuff like the junior closed rather and stuff like that. Um, so I pl- I didn't play in, in my U.S. championship until I was 16. Um, I'm not sure if I was qualifying by rating, but there was a rule back then that you, when you switch federations, you have to wait three years. And since I represented Armenia in World Youth, I, that applied to me. 
Um, I, I don't want to say like I was qualified. That's the reason I didn't play. Like I didn't even know if I could qualify by rating. But in I played my first US Championship. Uh, I want to say 2004, and that year was uh, something weird was going on because they had two US Championships. I think actually that's the year that Jennifer won the Invitational. Yeah, okay. Oh my god, this is, this is so long ago. Like I can't imagine. Like I can't believe how long 2004. How long ago was 2004? Yeah. But I think they had a. I think they had a special tournament because they want, needed the qualifier for the Olympiad. And then, if you remember back then, the US Championship was men and women played together, and which of course doesn't make sense for the purpose of determining a champion. Like it was 64 players, and like whoever scored the best from the women um, was the US women's champion. So they had like two US Championship that year. I want to say it was 2004. Okay. And the, were there other so? And there's probably the U.S. Women's Olympiad. So when were you? When did you make your debut there? Oh, actually, when I first moved here, my first big tournament was the um, the nationals. So I won the nationals twice for eighth and ninth grade. Let uh, me be the the last person to congratulate you for that. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, first Olympiad was. 2000, 2008, actually. Okay. Yeah, so this was your first Olympiad for um, for the U.S., but in my uh, intrepid research, I so you were, I read that you went to the 96 Olympiad, or you watched Polgar in the 90s, Judah Polgar in the 96 Olympiad? Yeah, I mean, I didn't play that, actually, obviously, but yeah, that's the year that Olympiad was held in Armenia. Okay. Which is, okay, now that I think about it, I think it's it's just amazing that the Olympiad was awarded to Armenia <laughs> during those years. Well, I mean, the, you know, FIDE will go anywhere. That, that much is uh, well established. Yeah, because, like, sometimes, like, I asked, like, a few players, and they, the way they describe it, it sounded a little... Sketchy. <laughs> okay, like uh, you know, you know, like the way you find a hotel, or it's like the food and the condition. But I mean, understandably so, because 1996 Armenia was like not a was not in a good place. But I mean, it was just amazing watching the Olympiad and you know being in a room and all the players. My dad would take me every day, so we would go to watch the games. That so that must have been pretty inspiring. Yeah, it, it really was. Uh, you... I mean, it's just like Olympiad is the best tournament to be in. I mean, playing in the Olympiad is just amazing. Even watching it is amazing. You know, all these great players in one room. And, like, when you're playing, you can just walk through the hall and then you see, like, Aronia and Magnus and, like, all these great players in one room and you're just playing in the same room. It's just mind-blowing. Yeah, I always feel that way on, like, the Chess 24 broadcast, like, when they go to break. Like, you, you know, I, obviously the, the coverage is great, too. But when they go to break and they're just showing the room, it's always like, you know, randomly like Magnus walks out in front of the camera. And like then there, there he is talking to Aronian or whoever. And it's like you, you get more of a sense of like what it's like to be there, you know, uh, which, you know, for me, like that's basically as close as I'll get. So, um, yeah, it's fun to watch. Yeah, it's amazing. Like in the dining hall or in like in the elevator, you run into someone, or in the bus, like just like Magnus walks in, or someone just walks in. Right. Like I remember one. I think last Olympia, like I was walking behind this guy, and he's just like the way he's walking, he's like stumbling around. His like shirt is tucked out, and I was like, who is this person? And then at some point, he turned around and it was Magnus. And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> Magnus, Magnus walking in front of me. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so. You said that Judah Polgar was your hero. Uh, I mean, <laughs> obviously, there's lots of reasons she could be your, your hero. But like, what was it about her that that made you um, look up to her? Well, she was the only woman playing among men, and I thought um, that was really inspiring. And you know, because in my um, in my group um, with my coach, I think I was the only girl. Uh, there was another girl. And I was the strongest or one of the strongest. And like when you're playing in the Armenian Championship, there's a girl section and a boy section. And I think I wasn't worse than any of the guys, but I was playing in a girl section and I was, you know, winning and playing in World Youth. But, you know, like I always had this competitive urge, like I wanted to beat all the boys and like play among them. And it was really inspiring to see her do it. Yeah, amazing. 
And I, from what I've gathered from your, your chess.com videos, it seems like you, you maybe have a similar style. Are you an attacking player? Yeah, I'm a very aggressive player. Nice. Um, yeah, so she's, she's a good hero. Have you, have you read her books? No, actually, I haven't. And I, <laughs> I didn't even listen to her podcast on your show. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll forgive <laughs> you. really to- bad because when I saw it, I was so excited and then I never listened to it. <laughs> okay. I mean, as a fan of hers, I don't feel like we covered all that much new ground. But yeah, she's, you know, she's got some good stories in there. But one thing I will say is like uh, her books are, are really good. I hadn't read them either until she was coming on the podcast. And then I had like a week to read all three of them. But I mean, it's kind of a, a unique blend of like, you know, memoir and game review. And she kind of mixes them in. And her enthusiasm for chess sort of really shines through in the books. And the other thing that shines through is sort of her appreciation of like the moments, you know, of like how unique it was to be like at the Olympiad and be this like amazing young talent with Kasparov, like going out of his way to check out your games and stuff like that. Like she's got amazing memory of like lots of details and uh, like good appreciation for, for like how much, you know, how incredible a life she's led. So, and it's good for teaching too, because like Mm -hmm. uh, since she goes from when she's like, you know, a young girl, it's like not everything is like so advanced that, you know, kids can't learn from it. And the stories are good. The stories she tells leading up to the games are good hooks for the kids. So anyway, strong recommendation for for all three of those books. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I I just, I mean, it's just amazing just by her existence. I think she has inspired so many people, so many women. You know, she didn't even have, like, she doesn't even have to say anything, right? You just hear, like, especially before she quit, of course. Like, you go to a tournament and you see Judith Polgar and you're like, oh, my God, it's Judith Polgar. Yeah. Yeah. And her games are, like, they're so much fun. I mean, like, yeah, like she could have had that rating without being, like, <laughs> such a fun player to study, you know. But but she happens to just have an amazing, like, style that everyone can learn from. Um. Okay. Well, since I mentioned the topic of books, Tatyov, as you probably know, I'm uh, I'm always looking for book recommendations for our listeners. So, do you have any books that were particularly, other than the Dvoretsky books uh, that you mentioned, that were like uh, really formative for you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely grew up on the Dvoretsky books. Um, oh my God! And I have to admit that I don't read chess books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's true of a lot of our guests, but but uh, the you know, sunshine is the best disinfectant. So it's good that you admit it. No, I actually like Albert's books a lot. I yeah. think they're really good. I feel like he kind of follows... I think Albert is like this generation, or today's Dvoretsky. Yeah, I agree. And he said that he learned so much from him, so I think it's uh, not not a coincidence. Um, yeah, and I, I guess when it comes to like teaching, Dvoretsky is probably the one who paved the way for, or at least set kind of the... Um, like the system of how to teach or how the approach to yeah. follow. And yeah, I mean, Algar's books are just great. I have all the series I've I've done. He's attacking, ma- not the attack, like the Grandmaster series, what is attack and defense, I think. Um, the one. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank too. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. so I've done that one. I've done his positional books. Um, I'm working through that. Like, I, I try to vary it up. Like, I don't... You know, I don't want to just, you know, you take one book and you just work one thing. So I try to sometimes do end game, sometimes do like positional chess. So I've, I've going through at least halfway through his strategic play and his, and I'm also working on his end game book. Okay. I, I really recommend his books. His books are really good. Yeah. It's been, definitely been a theme. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I still haven't gotten a chance to, uh, to check most of them out, but, um, Definitely, like when I get the time to to sink my teeth into some chess study, uh, I'll be going straight for those books. Um, so you mentioned so besides books, like w- if you do get a chance to study chess, like what what do you do? Like I mean, okay, for example, obviously you have the U.S. Women's Championship. I'm sure your biggest tournament of the year months away. So how mm-hmm. much of your time is spent like preparing for <laughs> your friends and opponents and how many, how much of it is just like generically trying to improve your chess? Uh, well, I try not to 
like I'm not gonna start studying for the US moments right now because I feel like if I put so much emphasis on one tournament and make it like the highlight of my year is just too much pressure on me. So and, have you learned that from experience? Um, like, did you used to do that or are you just sort of, you kind of knew all along as a seasoned chess player? I think just the US championship just has so much baggage for me because of my history right. <laughs> and my results. So I think just in and of itself, that tournament is just like, like I I already cannot just play it like any other tournament. Like right. there's just too much baggage and too much history. And, you know, if, um, especially I feel like last year after every game, it wasn't just like, oh, I lost the game or oh, I won a game. It's like, oh, I won a game. Now this is going to happen. Oh, this person is doing like this. And last year they did like this. The other year they did like that. So, you know, all these things, like all these scenarios after every game that I had in my mind. And then like what happened at the end, you know, was... You know, because like when I looked at the went back and looked at the tournament, like after I think first half of the tournament after five rounds, Sabina was at fifty percent. So it's, you know, she wasn't the favorite. Like you have fifty percent after five rounds, you're not the favorite to win when other people have like four out of five or ten half out of five. And then I realized, oh, you know, this is, like it's a long tournament, and um, you have to pace yourself, and you cannot have all this baggage. Which, of course, is very easy to say in theory, but in practice, it's very hard to do. Yeah, for sure. But, um, yeah, and, and I'm going to have a lot of tournaments. Um, I'm playing a tournament this weekend. I'm going to play in Reykjavik Open. Oh, fun. I'm hoping to get at least two more tournaments before that. So I cannot just ignore those tournaments and focus on the U.S. Championship. Yeah. So- but uh, as far as the U.S. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so it sounds like it's more like the, in terms of my question, it's more the latter. You just want to get better at chess and, the, you know, the rest will take care of itself. Well, in general, I do, but of course, for the U.S. Championship, I do specific preparation because uh, I've played in the U.S. Championship so many times and I've played a lot of the players so many times. And it's actually very funny because I feel like my every U.S. Championship is like the same. Like I get the same colors against everyone. Like I played against Sabina probably like eight times or nine times and I've played against her with white at least six times huh it's like and then you know against nazi i played like white every time um they're like several players like i get the same colors against them like every tournament so i feel like my u.s championship is not just repetitive in, in terms of the players but instead of the in terms of the colors i get against them that's so it's okay so this, I, yeah this... it's funny I want to get back to the U.S. Championship, but this can't. I, you're saying that makes me think of the the Hu Yifan controversy. I can't can't help but open that can of worms. What do you think of the like her being re- repaired against a woman like over and over and over again? You think uh, it was random or no? Um, I, I I really didn't understand that because um, so she like her whole issue was she thought that the organizers were conspiring against her, right? Right, uh, presumably. And I wasn't sure. I I wasn't sure why she would feel it would be that way because it's this is not a FIDA tournament, you know. It's not like I I know I can't even think of a FIDA tournament where she would play in where both men and women play together. Okay, it's not like let's say the Rapid and Blitz tournament or something like that where everyone can play. In. You know, it's like an open turn. It's at least not an open tournament, but it's like organized by one person and I thought she would had good relationship with the organizer. So it was very surprising that she would think that someone's conspiring against her. Yeah. Well, the thing is it's it, I think at first she might've felt that way too, but at some point, like it's so statistically improbable, like, you know, the first time you think, Oh, that's a coincidence. And then the second time you think, okay, you know, it happens. And the third time you're like, this is getting weird. And then by the fourth time, you're like, what the hell is going on? How does this keep happening? And then it carried over into her next tournament. So I certainly don't think she handled it the best way, but I could see how like that, you know, uh, you could start with like benign explanations and then let your mind go elsewhere for, uh, how it keeps happening. Yeah, I think, um, I'm sure it was frustrating for her because, um, like, for a long time, like, I saw her play in this tournament, the um, Grand Prix and even the Women's World Championship. The Women's World Championship, I can understand, it's, like, one tournament per year. But the Grand Prix, like, takes up, like, how many tournaments is it? Like, four or five tournaments? You know, there's, like, half of your yearly schedule. So I was, like, for the past few years, I always wondered, like, why is she playing in this? You know, it's like, you're so much stronger, you keep beating these people... 
like what what purpose is it serving you well it's a like, pretty good some, pretty good paycheck for one thing <laughs> yeah but uh, i mean she lives in china and doesn't the government like take most of your money anyways or i mean, i thought maybe the federation maybe is making her own thing but even for their point of view i would think they would want her you know to grow as a player like how right. many how many times can you win the same tournament yeah, no, it's a good point about the government. I, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, well, and now it seems like she's sort of moving in that direction, right? Like she's she's mostly trying to compete in, in men's events. Um, they're open events. They're not men's events. That, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... That no, a, I, I think it's going to be good for her as a chess player because it's, like, it's really interesting because when I look at this top woman and the tournaments they play in, they, like, they're... Their schedule is very similar to this top chess players like Magnus and Levon. Like they play in very select tournaments because you know they don't they don't have that many tournaments to pick from. But when I look at the top women, they're like twenty five, twenty six hundred, and well, very few are twenty six hundred. Actually, wait, no one is twenty six hundred. We said to you, fun, right? I think a couple are close. But I, don't, I think it's just. I don't think Juven Jun is twenty six. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, so most of them are mid to high 2500 the very top ones and there are so many tournaments for them to play in but they only play in the select tournament and like I, I probably it's financial but I just always wonder um, why why not broaden New Horizons actually yeah. one year I was playing in um, not one year, two years ago I was playing for US team in the world team and Anna and Crush declined so I was playing board one so I was playing all these top women, like Kostinyuk and Muzichuk, and so I was preparing, and at some point I realized, like, I'm seeing the same games over and over, and I'm like, why is this happening? And then I realized it's because they're constantly playing each- against each other, so when I'm preparing, I'm just looking at the same games over and over and over. Oh, right, from, like, different sides. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's so, like, because I'm looking at a game, and I'm like, I've seen this game, and the next round, I'm like, I've seen this game, this looks so familiar, like, where is this from? Then I'm like, oh, they're just playing against each other. And, like, for me, I play in the U.S. Championship every year, and, like, I get that experience, like, I'm playing the same players. But it's one tournament, and I play, on a good year, I play, like, ten tournaments. Right. And anyway, like, I'm not trying to criticize them, I'm just, um, you know, I'm just, like, it's just something I've noticed, and, like, I wonder if it's just financial, or it just probably makes more sense. To yeah, well, hopefully we'll have uh, have Kostyanik or someone like that on someday, and can try to get to the bottom of it. Um, yeah, I actually admire her a lot. Like she's she's a very fierce competitor. If you ever seen her play, like she is, like she's like a true professional. She approaches like if you see her play, her intensity, her like you can feel like she's a competitor. I, I, I'm sure you know she's more. Um, I don't want to say out there, but she's like more open. She's done more interviews and things like that. So when you read about her, like her preparation. I think before she played Hu Yifan in the World Championship match, like, years ago, she said she went somewhere away from civilization to prepare for that match alone. So she's, she's a very, like, a strong competitor. Yeah, yeah, very very focused whenever they, like, pan to her on the, mm-hmm. uh, um, on the camera. Um, okay. Yeah, even if she's giving a simul or anything, she's just her in intensity, and, like, I, I admire her, I admire that a lot. Yeah. Okay, so getting back to the U.S. Championship, I mean, I feel like this is a, a topic that's come up a few times because the, the chess world can seem so small, but I imagine you, a lot of these players are, are friends of yours that you're playing every year. Um, so is it hard to, like, you know, this is the biggest tournament for all of you and you're all sort of competing for the same title. Is that challenging? Mm. I don't think so. That's good. <laughs> because I think I think everyone just realizes that uh, you know everyone's on the same boat and everyone's there to win. So you're not like um, feeling particularly bad for anyone because you know like if it's not them, it's you and it's right. better to them. I mean, the one time I felt really bad when I was playing Anya last year and like she blundered against me, she blundered the queen, and. Yeah. It was a very difficult time for her because she had just lost her mother, and I mean, at that time I felt really bad. Like, even because during the game, I try not to feel bad, but right. I mean, 
think you, you can't feel bad for your opponent. But like after, I felt really bad, and like I wanted to say something, but I feel like I can't. Right. Yeah. So that's... that time was, um, you know, that's one like, one time I felt like really, really bad. Yeah, that situation can is awkward just generally if someone has like something sad happen to them and you don't know what you should say or if you should say something. So if you throw in a like super competitive chess game on top of that, and I would be. I would be even more confused about like how I should address it. Yeah, because you know when you're beating a friend and they're really upset, you want to comfort them. Like you're the reason why they're upset. Right. Yeah. Not a difficult spot to be in. Yeah, and especially with the the blunders. Yeah, because those those sting so much. Like even more so. Like okay, if someone just grinds you down, you know, you you tip their cap, you tip your cap to them, and and move on. But if it's kind of like feels unjust, you know, it's got to be even harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was okay. Like I'm saying, like I feel bad about. Of course, she played. She felt hundred times worse than me. Right. Yeah. But every every chess player knows what it feels like. That that's for sure. Mm hmm. Okay. So Tatya, I think we've covered most of the serious stuff that I have here on my list. But obviously, I I, I need to ask you about a topic very dear to you, uh, penguins. <laughs> well, and uh, what what's the story with penguins? How did uh they become your um your your obsession? Um, I don't know, actually. It wasn't specific things, but I feel like a lot of people encouraged it. <laughs> so I would get all these gifts, like toys and like shirts and t-shirts and everything. So I think over time it just grew and grew. I just, you know, just really love them. They're, they're amazing creatures. So I imagine you've seen March of the Penguins? No, actually I haven't. Because <laughs> oh, really? I know the main penguin dies and I don't want to watch it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, I actually, I once told a friend of mine, actually the, the friend's husband may or may not hear this podcast, but a friend of mine that I liked penguins, they were one of my favorite animals and she kind of ran with it. Uh, they're like, I like them, but like, you know, that's like, if someone asks you what your favorite animal is, you, you have to name one, you know? So it's not like I was obsessed with them or anything, but anyway, I have a giant stuffed penguin in my house too, that I wanted to show you before we were recording, but I didn't get a chance, but so I've also gotten penguin related gifts <laughs> yeah i have like a box full of them and i was thinking of donating them but i kind of feel bad well it's a part of your brand so <laughs> yeah like my hair <laughs> right yeah yeah so is your hair like do you keep it the same color or like uh like how do you decide if you want to change it uh actually my hair is blue now so i, I changed it for uh for the season but during the summer i added some pink in it because it's more a summery color okay and do you know uh, Kostya Kavutsky? Yeah, of course. And did you see that he dyed his hair blue? Yeah, but his hair doesn't look blue. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what, what, what happened there. Do you, do you have any advice for him as like a blue-haired individual? Uh, actually, maybe I think maybe he washed it and it faded into that. So I'm kind of worried about what <laughs> might, because like when you get this kind of colorful hair, every time you wash it, it fades, and then sometimes the fading process is good. Sometimes it's just terrible. So I'm kind of scared of what's going to happen to my hair after a few washes. Uh-oh. Speaking <laughs> the voice of experience. So you must get some funny comments from kids about it. No, actually, kids, I love my hair. And they always comment. They're like, oh, I like your purple hair. One of my students told me he likes my blue hair. So I said, oh, you don't like my purple hair. I said, oh, I like your purple hair, but mine is curly because my natural <laughs> hair is curly. And I was like, like I, I never thought they would be they would pay so much attention to it. No, yeah. but I still love my hair. That's funny. Do they, I, I'm guessing they asked to touch it and stuff like that. Mm, nah. Okay. I think it's my hair stains. So I don't <laughs> okay. Um, and Tatya, what else? Like, what are your interests outside of chess? Um, I'm into fitness and healthy living. So and cooking. So I try to live a healthy lifestyle. So many healthy chess players these days. Every time I ask someone, they're like exercising. No one, no one says like, well, one or two exceptions, but no one really says smoking and drinking. <laughs> well, I mean, I think everyone does it. It's just no one says it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. I mean, and yeah, if you're going to do smoking and drinking, then you need, you need to exercise even more. So. so if you ask me what I'm passionate about and I say drinking alcohol, <laughs> it's going to make me sound like a degenerate. <laughs> this is true. Although you did have a tweet about, you did have a tweet on that topic, I believe. Oh, about buying wine? Yeah. Buying wine at 11 a.m. <laughs> Yeah, you, you got to prepare for the week. Yeah, no, it happens. Um, but I think it's like a trend now. 
in maybe it's just because I live in Southern California and everything is just exaggerated here. But I think a lot of people are into healthy living and fitness because now every store I go to, they have um, section of uh, fitness clothes, like you know, workout clothes, and like you go on Instagram. Well, again, maybe it's just directed at me because that's what I follow. All this, like all these people who are building their brand just based on fitness and healthy lifestyle. So you're trying Which to eat. Good thing. You're trying mm-hmm. to eat healthy as well. Yeah, I like on Sundays I'll meal prep, so I'll make my meals for the week, which is really time saving actually. So I'll make like lunch and salads, and like I'll cut my vegetables. So when I come home, I can just put something in the oven and cook quickly. Nice. And so, like, what sort of uh, diet do you try? I mean, not like diet in the sense of losing weight, but diet and like uh, what sort of foods are you trying to eat to to have a healthy lifestyle? Uh, well, I was vegetarian since high school. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, like senior year of high school, I think, or maybe junior. Um, but I started eating fish several years ago, so I'm a pescatarian now. Okay. Um, which I kind of feel bad about, but I think it's healthier than, at least the way I was eating vegetarian was not healthy because you can eat like pasta and right. carbs, rice. Um, I'll try to eat, I try to eat mainly... I mean, what I like to eat and what I eat are a little different. But I, I try to eat a lot of vegetables. I, I just like to roast vegetables, like anything you put in the oven, I think just tastes good. And like um, try to eat more protein because I work out and like I lift weights. So I try to okay. eat more like lean and clean diet. Gotcha. Um you guys are such uh, such good good role models for our, our younger listeners with your your healthy eating. I can I'm good on the exercise, but I'm not so I'm not such a good uh, exemplar of healthy eating. I have to say. No, neither am I. Actually, like it's it, like when I eat out or when that's my problem. When I eat out, like all my rules go out of the window. Or during the tournament because I'm a stress eater, so right. I just eat anything, especially like because a lot of times I have uh, trouble sleeping. Mm-hmm. especially during tournaments so when i don't sleep well you know it's like coffee and chocolate and like anything just to give my energy out yeah but, uh, i think if i could apply this to when i'm traveling then that'd be good but i do no i mean i think exercising is easy so to say it's you can do it but being disciplined to eat right because you know you eat more than you exercise you have like several meals a day and you work out once a day so it's harder to be eating right so right. many times yeah, no, and I mean it's generally harder to eat healthy when you're traveling just because you, you know you don't have the groceries that you would have and the access to make stuff. But also competing in a chess tournament, you know, like decision fatigue is a thing. Like the more decisions you make, the easier it is to make bad ones. So it's like you know, and obviously the nature of a chess competition is all you're doing is making decisions. So when you have another one about what to eat, I think it's hard to to necessarily make the you know, the choice that would be the healthiest. At least, oh, that, I like that. At least that's my excuse. <laughs> I'm such a bad decision making I'm a decision maker. I'm gonna start using that excuse. Exactly. Decision that's fatigue. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Um so what do you do? Okay, we're almost done here, but like what do you do in LA? Like how do you like life in SoCal now that you're you know, sufficiently adjusted from moving as a, a teenager? Oh, I love LA. I think it's my, my favorite place to be it you know it's always nice the weather is nice it's so pretty i don't like the traffic but fortunately i'm self-employed so i don't have to be on the freeway during the rush hour but i think southern california is amazing yeah great weather seems like strong chest culture too i think more so in norcal now unfortunately but I think our scholastic chess is pretty strong because every time I go to a tournament, my opponents are getting younger and younger. Like yeah. last last tournament I played in, my opponent was tiny. And yeah. then I, I looked him up and then he said he was born in like 2007 or something. Oh my goodness. And then like I had to take a moment to see like how old, like how old is 2007. So that was your because last your last round opponent? Or, no, it's I, like my first round. Oh, okay. Um yeah, because I looked at the cross table. I didn't look at the games, but you played a couple like title players whose names I recognized, and then a couple sort of like, you know, twenty two to twenty three hundreds who I didn't. So I'm guessing those were the the youngins. 
Yeah, because when I see someone born in 2000, I still don't think they're real people, even though some of them like graduating from high school already. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So I'm... yeah, when I see like 2007, like I have to take a moment and like actually do the math in my head just to see how old they are because it's you know time is just going so fast and it's, it's kind of crazy. Nice. Okay. So all right, last topic, Tatya. So we talked generically about um, you know your your preparation and books and stuff like that, but like. What what advice do you give your students? Like, what's your philosophy of how people should should improve at chess? Um, well, that's a general question, but I think the main thing is tactics. Yeah, being sharp and being able to calculate. Um, because I don't know until like eighteen hundred, two thousand. I feel like it's the most important thing. Because I see like players, they'll play, like they'll learn an opening, they blitz out their moves, and then later they like ponder, they'll miscalculate. So I think uh, being able to calculate and like I think that's the talent. That having that talent is important. Like being sharp, like having that intuition for tactics. So I think it's very important to be able to build that up. Yeah, that's generally my go-to advice as well. Although I'm, I've been surprised how many guests here have said different things. Um, that, like what? Uh, you know, talking about chess, like, like Jan Gustafsson was talking about chess psychology. And, um, you know, people say, like, he also said, just just study what you like. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, other examples. But for me, it's like tactics is, the, you know, is the answer, at least up in, like you say, up until around, say, 2000 or something like that. Um, but but people's, people's advice runs the gamut. I think it's kind well, of... Not as interesting an answer, maybe. But I think for younger players, like, psych- I feel like some of them have some psychological issues, but for a lot of them, they just kind of let go of things more easily. Right. Because, again, they don't have this baggage of, oh, like, this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, or I've had this experience. Like, some of them do, but, like, they'll get into a bad position, and then they won't be like, oh, no, I messed up my game, now I'm bad. They, like, they don't care about having to make, like, decisions that are you know it's like you have to put a piece on a bad square and they're not like oh no like I, what did i do it's now i have to make this decision for them to just play and like when you say study what you like i think that's a good thing to do when you're not motivated right yeah when you're old like me it's good advice i think but if you're like yeah really trying to climb the ladder um you kind of need to be practical about where where the best uh return on your time is yeah, and I feel like a lot of it, you have to change your attitude. And this is something, who did I hear this from? This is from, um, like I ran an interview or something from Michael Braun, who's a player from Southern California. Right. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, he's super, he, speaking of good tactics, yeah. And he said, like, oh, he's always, like, fascinated by the position that's in front of him, you know, because every time you get a new position and, you know, like you may never have, have that position again and he's just tries to explore the position and learn something new and i think that's a good attitude to have because sometimes you find yourself in a position you don't like so whenever i do that during the game you know i just try to tell myself okay you know like i don't like this position or i don't know this position at least i can learn something at, from this nice yeah that's good advice for sure Again, this is something good in theory. In practice, doesn't always <laughs> right, work. Yeah. But I think you know it's important. Like if you keep doing it, uh, it can become a, become a habit. And instead of like, I don't know if other players do it, but you know, blaming yourself during the game or getting angry at yourself, kind of change your attitude so you can be more objective about the position in front of you. Yeah, I think everyone has to has to reckon with that uh, to to some degree. Um, okay, so Tatia. Um, how if people would like to thank you for this wonderful interview um or otherwise um reach out to you what's what's the best place to contact you um, i don't want people to contact me <laughs> well you're on you're on twitter i'll out you there so yeah i was kidding yeah i think on twitter because i try to keep my facebook um uh, more private i think on twitter is a good way to contact me okay yeah so i'll uh, i'll link to that but everyone leave her alone 
<laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think that that is everything. So good luck in the North American Open. Um, and oh, it's just American Open. Oh, American Open. I can't keep yeah. the continental names straight because I always feel like they're kind of generic. So it's like I, I always know the tournament, but not the name. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, we'll be rooting for you. Uh, okay. And good luck oh, beyond okay. that as well. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for coming on, Tatu. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone who supports Perpetual Chess. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing it, it can be hard to find the time. Donations from listeners make a huge difference and make Perpetual Chess a lot more sustainable. Special shout out to my Patreon Perpetual Partners. They are Johnny McMenamin, Todd Bryant, Greg Shahadi, Jens Green, Timothy Ha, Tatia Vabramahan, Paul Sweeney, Jennifer Shahadi, Pascal Charbonneau, Zhao Cheng, Kelly Palmer, Matthew Tedesco, Gary Andrews, Krishna Galapakrishnan, Ricky Grahava, Chris Flanagan, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Rob Lazorchek, Jennifer Valens, Tim Seymour, and Chris Wayne Scott. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll catch you guys next week with another episode.